it's not so much the apocalypse as it is like the post apocalypse. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Cause it's like, right. if the world is going to end, yeah, then it's done. Right. And like, right. Doesn't really matter so right, much. Right. Right. Your preps. But if it's a more slow apocalypse or a like minor one in that, you know, most yeah. people don't die or you're one of the people who are left, then it matters a little more like yeah. what you do now. Right. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast today. Return guest Athena Actipus is joining the show, and she is associate professor at the Department of Psychology at Arizona State University, and she is also the co-director of the Human Generosity Project. I believe the last couple times she's been on, we've been chatting about, about cancer. She has a wonderful book, uh, which we're going to do a whole episode about in the future, But we, because we've touched on uh, some of her cancer research in the past. The book is called The Cheating Cell, How Evolution Helps Understand and Treat Cancer. And she's also um, uh, I reached out to her just because I was thinking, uh, like, who haven't I talked to in a while that I want to? That's a fun science communicator. And she has her own science communication podcast, Zombified. She is the chair of the zombie apoc apocalypse medicine uh, meeting as well. So if you guys are longtime listeners, now you might be like going, oh, yes, that rings a bell. Because I haven't had too many people on that study zombies, Athena. <laughs> no, it's not like a new thing that half of your guests are doing. <laughs> no. Um, so first of all, let's just assume that um, no one's no one's heard the past episodes, that we have some new listeners or that it's been a while and, and people need a refresher. And uh, tell people a little bit about some of the apocalypse and zombie stuff uh, that you work on and why. Well, I um, I love the zombie apocalypse as kind of a way to engage about stuff that's like fundamentally pretty scary and existentially threatening, but in a fun way so that we can kind of bring our brains together and, and do something about it. So, so yeah, I'm curious, Shane, for you, like, are you more worried about like zombies and zombification or like general apocalyptic situations? I mean, usually um, people are like zombie apocalypse, like one thing, but you know, they're like, th there's, there's a certain extent to which you can kind of separate the like fear of being taken over mm -hmm. versus the fear of the world ending. Like which one is worse for you? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I would say so. First off, zombies, no, I'm not, I, I, I don't, most things, most things that are like sensationalized in um, fictional, fictional television, I'm not super worried about. I actually think it's part of why people had such a hard time wrapping their heads around like COVID because it wasn't, people expect like, Oh, global pandemic, you know, someone gets like bitten and then they start running around and chasing you. And like, no, it's usually like tuberculosis where you come in contact with someone and then 15 years later, you just start getting pale and coffee. And, and, and that's like, it's a, the apocalypse is, a, is always like a little slower and boring from the, from the, or, or pandemics usually are more slow and boring than uh, like what as a world war Z or something like that. That's like a zombie apocalypse pandemic uh, sort of that combines a lot. Were you totally. a fan? Yeah, um, I have read most of the Brett. book, but I have not. I haven't seen the movie actually. That's pretty good. Yeah, I don't know if but you've heard of Brad Shane, Pitt. I have to tell you though. I mean, you're saying like you know, COVID, not a zombie <laughs> apocalypse, but but 
there's all this stuff that COVID does that yeah. like changes human behavior. You know, it Hit interferes me. with like pain receptors. And so like if you are in the early stages of COVID, yeah. you're like, oh, I feel great. Yeah. So um, I got to get out there. I'm exactly, feeling social. Exactly. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's quite possible that part of why COVID has been so successful is because it manipulates human behavior and, you know, how we feel in a way that makes humans who are infected more likely to go out and spread it. Yeah. Um, so it might be a zombie apocalypse, um, actually. That's amazing. Yeah, I have. Uh, 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 yeah, never mind. I won't. I was going to talk about some family members that got COVID that behaved like utterly ridiculously before and after. Oh, um, before and, and after. It so it's not. Yeah. But it was also just like you would think nine months of lacking energy and not having a sense of smell and like just mustering enough energy to get social gatherings together to host because you're just not going to be happy until everyone has got covid um mm. too but there there is also like that it got so political and everything else what about what's your feelings about the um, cause first off, this isn't even what we're going to be talking about today, but this is, and now people are going to be disappointed because they're going to be like, we thought we were going to hear about zombies all we day. Can and then always you guys talk about, come back to zombies. We Shane. go back and it forth just between loop zombies around, and come kombucha back zombies. Yep. and zombies again, because yeah, I want it. Like anti-zombification, <laughs> maybe a little bit kombucha yeah. to keep the zombies away or, you know, fend off like the forces of zombification that are trying to take you over. Well, Maybe it's, it's an anti-zombification elixir. It, we'll, we'll, we'll probably get into a little bit of everything that you do, but it's not only are you, do you, are you into studying apocalypse stuff that most general audience is going to be interested in. That's very attention grabbing, very interesting. Well, I mean, we've talked about it before. We're going to get you on again in the future to talk. I mean, it's an endless conversation, but. Um, also you do cancer research and who doesn't care about cancer and wanting to get, uh, treat cancer better and everything else. But me, I'm like, Oh, it looks like Athena did a little stuff with the kombucha. I want to hear, I want to hear about, I want to hear about the, the kombucha. I think I just have odd preferences, um, for things, but let's, what do you think about, um, the, uh, uh std what are people saying these days stds or stis is it didn't it get like political for a while but I'm where they sure. were like yeah well, you can't say disease anymore and then i think people are like we gave up we tried to push for the stis and now we're okay with if you say stds but anyway let's call it stis because i'm talking with a scientist and this is a science podcast sort of after all um, what do you think about the idea of STIs um, hijacking someone's brain and making them horny? Um, if I were an STI, that's what I would do. Right. You right. know, like it's a pretty good evolutionary strategy. So if it, you know, is mechanistically possible, then that shit's going to evolve. I think the question is, you know, like, what are the mechanisms, right? And, like, it's been kind of hard to sort out the mechanisms. But, um, you know, I mean, we know that, like, in mammals that that happens, right? So Toxoplasma gondii, if it gets into rodents, it literally gives them, like, hard-ons for their predators. And the predator eats them and continues the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii. So, um, hmm. you know, so That's mammals amazing. can get manipulated to get turned on by things that aren't in their evolutionary benefit. Yeah. I mean, I'm now, now I'm almost more concerned that we don't know the mechanisms of horniness. Don't you think that's like something that we <laughs> totally. should get down to the bottom of? I think so. Yeah. That's that, kind of, yeah. That's a very good point. What, like how is that? Yeah. That's, that seems like a blind spot. I mean, you know, in, in the way that, in the way that the internet, 
launched basically because of porn or like was the porn was much the catalyst for uh the internet's fast growth and also um you know things like um viagra or something where it's just like was gonna be a heart medication and like yeah maybe someone will like this heart medication whoa look at what this can do and then it doesn't matter if you're some uh you know naturalist all organic hippie or whatever you are or you're just against chemicals or big farmer or whatever people are like oh, but viagra you know okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and i i feel like uh i feel like um in in the way that in the way that when you put a man on the moon or a person on the moon, all, all that goes into building that technology to make that spacecraft to get that up there. There's all this. There's to, the to cast, get it up there, Shane. To get it up there, yeah. And uh, there's all the there's the um, there's all these positive byproducts of all these different technologies that had to um, that had to come along, and now we have like better beds or ways of sealing food or what i don't know what all came out of the moon stuff if it was real but um but <laughs> but but this is i want to figure out the 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 mechanisms of horniness do, feel do like you, do you know the stuff about like some of the early work that they did um trying to get people to cooperate more in economic experiments using oxytocin so they'd have like people you know use these like oxytocin nasal sprays and you know like people call oxytocin the cuddle hormone the love hormone mm. right like the parenting hormone it makes you feel all warm and fuzzy well mm. one of the um side effects that they like didn't really report in most of these studies was the fact that it would like give men everlasting hard ons. They would just be like playing the economic experiment. They're like prisoner's dilemma. Do I cooperate or defect with like a raging hard on from the yeah. oxytocin that they, you know, nasally administered. So huh. yeah, I guess. So that's at least I, one two? um that, you know, has been identified I mean, that's pretty, indirectly. <laughs> that's pretty context dependent whether or not you're going to cooperate more with a raging hard on. <laughs> totally. Isn't it? I mean, there's totally, a lot of. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's like in some species, you get an erection and it's like, whoa, that means one thing. And then like hyenas, it means a different thing. Like hyenas, <laughs> the males are like, hey, erection over here. Don't hurt me. I'm, I'm a wimpy. <laughs> I have a wimpy erection, whereas it means like <laughs> other things in other, uh, <laughs> in yeah, other species. Yeah, very context dependent. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, well, just in terms of horniness, you would think that there has to be, there has to be a, a you know, evolution would have, w would have made it much in the way of like a personality trait. Like some people are very conscientious. Some people are like OCD. They, they kind of go so far with it. And then some people are huge slobs like myself, very low in conscientiousness. There has to be that sliding scale with horniness where there's people that are like bordering on asexual and then people that are, that are sex addicts and whatever is making that occur. There has to be some little bugger out there that could, some virus that could get in the brain and just dial that up a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the thing is like once you've built cognitive machinery to do stuff or hormonal machinery to do stuff, then, you know, all you need is something that can produce the, you know, factor that can, you know, bind to that receptor. Right. It's mm -hmm. like if you build a machine that has a bunch of buttons, like something can come along and push that button. It's weird that no one, there's no drug marketed as this will make you hornier. Oh, that's not true. I guess they try to give that to late the guys. They're like, this will make you harder Yeah, <laughs> because guys yeah. are like, I was already horny enough. I just need. The, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, and, then, and then for ladies, they're like, we got to get these ladies hornier. Exactly. <laughs> because otherwise, what are we going to do with these hard ons? So, you yeah. know, it's like. Yeah. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So for well, now I want to talk about. Could I give you my 
order of apocalyptic fears. Yeah. And I Let's, want, because yeah, I, I kind of want to hear yours. So there is the, I mean, even before COVID, I always thought viruses are pretty interesting in, in that they're just, always grinding away and the red queen the host uh, the host virus parasite interaction that's they evolve so much faster than we do so so much faster speaking yep. of sex do, are, are you into that uh the idea what, that, what am i what are you asking it, if i'm the, into in terms of sex the it, this it, part it, the <laughs> both if you're into that the idea that the idea that evolution um evolution stumbled on and then selected for uh sexual reproduction um as a way of outwitting um parasites and diseases as a as a way of combining the uh genetic material and creating generation rather than rather than cloning have you yeah, you know what I, I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think that it's quite likely that's part of the explanation. But like the very big picture is that there is lots of mm -hmm. organisms that are asexual. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it, just because we're sexual doesn't mean that like everything is. And that's what needs to be explained. So um, but yeah, when you start, you know, building like a large multicellular body that has to last for a really long time and you know pathogens are one of the threats like i could totally see that being part of the selection pressures for um for sex um mm. i don't i don't know if that's the the whole explanation because mm. there's probably a lot of other reasons to um you know mix things up a little i mean uh like for for example, um, something people don't talk about a lot, but is totally a thing that can happen is uh, is vertically transmitted cancer. So you know you can What's have cells pass from the maternal body to the fetal body, or vice versa. Mm. They do all the time, um, and you know if the if a fetus is identical to mom then the chance that the cancer would be able to take hold would be much higher. So you should mix up the immune wow. system a little bit. So anyway, that's my, that's like one other possibility for why it might be good to have sex. So cancer has been around for over a billion years. It's, it's been around since the origins of multicellularity. So like 3 billion years ago. Well, it Let's see, multicellularity, where, what's that, like 2 billion, 2.5 so, billion? So somewhere between, you know, 500 million and a billion, it kind of depends where you, what what numbers you go with mm. for, yeah. Hmm. Um, so a long time, a very long so, time. So cancer just got in right in there right away. It's basically just cheating in multicellular cooperation, right? So it's like once you go from having just a few cells to having like a body, then mm. the cells like have to be cooperating, right? They have to be like not dividing like crazy, not consuming resources like crazy, uh, you know, doing all this stuff so they can function together. And if a cell goes rogue and divides like crazy, then it can compromise the you know, glob globular proto multicellular thing, right? So yeah, cancer yeah. was around from the very beginning. Oh, wow. So cancer's like this libertarian anti-conformist, like yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna take it to the man. Sort exactly. of exactly. Uh, yep. Yep. It it does not want to be working for the man. <laughs> so. Interesting. I mean, and obviously we're speaking now in, you know, metaphors. intentional terms, which are not technical what like it's not like <laughs> cancer's like oh fuck you right yeah, yeah, um because yeah. it doesn't have a brain it's but just accidentally stumbling on these sort of things that favor exactly. its replication exactly yeah mm -hmm. what about um how how diverse is cancer through different species is it because I, I really i'm so into co um convergent evolution 
because you just don't hear about it that much. You know, when yeah. you when you think about evolution, you think these evolutionary trees and these things breaking off and becoming different primates and stuff. But then there's there's things like you know the 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 two and the three fingered sloth that exists today don't have a com their common ancestors like 65 million years ago or something they're they're cool. a product of co-evolution they Con- ended up convergent like convergent oh, evolution oh oh yeah yeah, yeah. so convergent evolution yeah what was, it? what was i saying co-evolution uh yeah it, it, convergent evolution yeah my mistake uh, but they ended up being like same size very similar patterns of how they eat things, the way in which yeah. they mate, their there, pooping pattern. Like there's crazy. a lot of that. There's a lot of that in cancer. So you have, you know, even you know, within a species, right? So human cancers, super diverse in terms of the genetics, right? So you know, two people who have um breast cancer could have totally genetically different breast cancers even though they're both breast cancer and they're both in humans um across species yeah you know obviously you have huge potential diversity there as well but what you do see is um convergence of the phenotypes of the characteristics that the cancer cells have so you see things like um sort of breaking free of constraints on division and replication you see um oh, wait could i'm sorry could could you explain that yeah sure so most of our cells they have like a little system that says like divide now stop dividing now and that's part of why we can maintain ourselves mm. as functional multicellular organisms, like our tissues replace themselves when they need to, um, and we don't have like gross growing out of control. But in cancer, the genes that regulate that get messed up, and the cells will keep dividing, even though the cells around them and the other sort of systems that they should be following are saying don't. So, so yeah, cancer is this cellular cheater. It is replicating, using resources, trashing the environment um, in ways that give it an evolutionary advantage inside the host, um, but are ultimately you know, negative for the fitness, well-being, health of the host that they're in. Trashing the environment because the environment would, would potentially us. have some defenses? Well, and, you know, If you think about it, like our whole bodies are this cellular civilization that's doing stuff, including like there are waste products of the things that our cells do. And those need to like get, you know, processed to a certain extent and then removed because like, you know, our cells are sort of in this milieu where there's all this stuff around and like there's other cells that like come and they collect the trash and things like that. Mm -hmm. And cancer cells will like they will just produce um, you know, acid that breaks down the environment around them. They're, you know, they're like the, they're basically slobs. Hmm. Um, and, and not just slobs, but the stuff that they produce can actually break down the environment and make it easier for them to then like invade new areas. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, baby. So, okay. So, Oh, that's interesting. So, so they release something that's weakening the environment around that then makes it easier to invade before they even start evading, and that's or invading, mm-hmm. and that's just that's just something that's just that it's yeah. stumbled upon. <laughs> yeah, and I mean it's, and then Amazing. it's probably the case, right, that the ones that are producing the acid that's breaking down the environment and you know that's if that's allowing them to spread and replicate more then they're getting an evolutionary advantage from that in the host and um that is then potentially getting selected for Mm. Mm. and it i mean and also the metabolism that leads to that acid production is like sort of more dirty and wasteful and like they can get more energy from it, but it trashes the environment more. So they're like, you know, they're getting a benefit in terms of extracting more resources, um, 
you know, getting more space, uh, having the chance to replicate more. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not good for us, uh, or right. any other multicellular species for that matter. Oh man. Well, speaking of things that aren't good, I, let me, let me throw my ranking out. Um, down oh yeah. We were talking that... about the apocalypse, right? Well, yeah, I guess what's number one for it. Gosh, it's, I mean, I think global warming gets so many points just because it does so much with like, yeah. Lo loss of biodiversity and that creating more viruses and just the cascade of of just the feedback loops of totally. awfulness that can happen that then lead to a shortage of resources and war and all uh, yeah and and so that one seems like the most brutal and then there's i mean it's hard for me to think about apocalypse scenarios without thinking about nukes and nuclear winters. Um, I yeah, that's some I, scary shit. I, yeah, I think that uh, like I, I I get a lot of real nuclear winter vibes. Uh, like that's that's the. Have you seen the road? I think a long time ago. I think that's that's what started that mm -hmm. was the premise maybe, but. But just the idea of uh, of of enough nukes, which you know, two ter two territories, whether it's uh, yeah, this is like Indian Pakistan or something like that. If they just like we're gonna launch at one another and don't say they have leadership that doesn't understand the <laughs> the significance and the implications of what could happen. It's it doesn't. I think that we found out during COVID um, that it doesn't take like a Dr. Strange love, like one general that went crazy sort of thing. It can just like good old fashioned male ego with some ignorance and what's this a little narcissism do? thrown in there, yeah, you know, little... like I know everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And but the idea of not just the evaporating of an area, which most people are like, well, whatever, we bomb them. And, but but the idea of all that smoke blocking out the sun and circling the earth and wiping out the crops and and that's that's the one that because there's the flash of the the evaporation one or like the radiation, the evaporation. It's like, not so well, much the apocalypse as it is like the post apocalypse. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Cuz it's like right. if the world is going to end, yeah. Then it's done, right? And like R right. doesn't really matter so right, much. Right, right. Your preps. But if it's a more slow apocalypse or a like minor one in that you know most yeah. people don't die or you're one of the people who are left, then it matters a little more like yeah. what you do now, right? Yeah, a minor apocalypse. I love that as a term. Uh, just like, <laughs> just, it just, it's a matter <laughs> of degree, right? It's like, you know, some are worse than others for sure. Yeah, we have like, yeah, we have some spikes on our wheels and our like Mad Max vehicles That's right. yeah, still, yeah. but they're like solar powered. We don't use the whole like <laughs> blood and the uh, draining um, process. That's full apocalyptic. This is just like mini apocalypse. Yes, we still have like chariot race situations and deserts and stuff. But exactly, we've got some small scale farming <laughs> going on. We're like bringing back like dry farming, like the Anasazi. You know, like right? There's yeah, right. there's options if uh, if you're creative and you you know have some cultural memory of how previous humans made it through tough times. So. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the other thing. Cause we, we started, we were going to record yesterday and had technical issues. Well, you were also going through your own apocalyptic ish vibes. As yes. You're in. Apocalyptic. -ish, that's one of my favorite phrases or terms. Uh, apocalyptic. -ish. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's totally apocalyptic right here, right now. I mean, yesterday was a little bit more cause like Literally, you know, I'd look down my street and there's smoke in the air and there's like ash falling down on me. 
The, you're yeah, in Arizona right I'm now. In Arizona. There's I'm in Arizona. I'm in Flagstaff. And, and yep. uh, at the, if, I, yep. who, cause who knows where this will be at the time that this airs, which might be a couple of weeks or something like that. This might yeah. be the last interview you ever do. We might, no it's one, possible. This might, yeah. You might burn this alive is... shortly after this or during. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we were, we were, you were mentioning. Yeah. It's like you, 20 miles out of town in one direction, there's a big fire and like 30 miles in another direction, there's a big fire. Uh, and then like kind of all over the state, actually, there are fires burning. So um, it's, it's kind of crazy. And uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure yesterday that I had enough time to you know, make sure that I got everything in my go bag and it's by the door with my camping equipment and, you know, ready to go if I need to. So. And meanwhile, we were trying to record and having technical problems as, as you also have a go bag ready in case <laughs> everything starts on fire. And then, yeah. and then we're, in the, uh, we put it off till today. But one, one thing, um, when we were talking off air or during or whatever, Yesterday, you were kind of making this point about how humans had, uh, uh, you know, humans have made it through so many situations in the past. And that's something that seemed to give you hope. But I was thinking about that today and it's like, did they make it through? Like, or was well, it that humans that weren't impacted by this is like, the paradox, right? It's like if you look at human history and you're like, oh, okay, it was totally normal, like for in a human lifetime for 20 or 30 percent of people in your group to die, yeah. like of unnatural causes. Um, should that make you feel like, oh, okay, then we can do this or be like, yeah. oh, shit, like that's I don't like those odds, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, they, sur well, there's been like volcanoes that exploded and humans survived that. Well, no, not the humans that were there, like humans <laughs> that were across the earth in a different place, not impacted by that survived, surely. But don't, aren't yeah, you although, although at the same time, like, you know, here outside of Flagstaff, um, there are these ruins. I actually visited them this weekend of, you know, an ancient civilization that lived there and the volcanoes were going off and they're like, you know, as long as it doesn't get too bad, we've got the ash falling, it's fertilizing the soil. We're all good. So they yeah. actually like the population expanded after the volcanoes erupted because it improved the farming. Oh, yeah, all that ash. Yeah, Great fertilizer. Yeah. So it's like, you know, yeah, volcano erupting, dying from, you know, getting covered in lava, but also better farming. So cucumbers. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's uh, that's I mean, I don't think that we're there as a species anymore where we're, I mean, we're a bit spoiled now, like since germ theory and st it, it's kind of, <laughs> we've been spoiled uh, since germ theory. I like that. Totally. There's, yeah. <laughs> there, there, because it's, because you can kind of, there's this idea that we can conquer we can mm -hmm. beat this we can make vaccines we can beat cancer we can keep developing alzheimer's we'll keep expanding our and death is just this thing that we're just we just need to create more technology to manage it and we whereas or death used to be a normal our, accepted part our consciousness, of life let's just upload our consciousness into outer you space into and then we'll just put it out there and then we'll live forever you into that? You because uh, I was for a while, <laughs> like twenty years do you, ago. Do you think but then I'm I into learned that? more. I don't know. No. Uh, I'm not into that. I just like to make fun of it. Don't, I'm kind of worried yeah, that I, I was into it when I was a young man, like when I was like twenty and like into the latest back and greatest when I was young and stupid. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't think one. I don't think it's gonna happen. Um, but. That was like Ray Kurzweil popularized mm -hmm. that and everything. I, I don't think it has a lot of traction. Yeah, I don't know. I think like we need our bodies to think. I'm into the embodied cognition thing. I like the, uh, oh, I love it. And our microbes. I don't know. Sure. I kind of feel like my microbes are part of me. 
Like, oh man, we got to talk about yeah. microbes. We got to yeah. get on this microbe train. That's okay. We still have time. <laughs> so many places to go. There's always uh, time for microbes. So. Um, yeah. Cause, well, it's like the uh, when people started freezing them, so, like the, the cryogenic. cryogenic. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird shit. And like some of that is in Arizona. Like if I you were going to be that. like, where should I start a company to like freeze people's bodies indefinitely? How about a place where it's 120 degrees in the summer? Yeah. Not to mention, <laughs> if you just look into it a little bit, free, freezing freezing cells makes them rip apart. Like if you put a soda can I, in, a, I, actually, in a freezer. Actually, I think they're like using a different, I think it's like liquid nitrogen, which is different, I think. Oh, so they're not ripping apart the cells? I into- don't think so. But- Really, you should get some of them to come on your podcast and talk to them about it. Yeah, because that was my impression was maybe I mean, that if was you just like me. Put liking your to- head in your freezer. Yeah, probably you're. It's not gonna. It's not gonna work. Because yeah. now you need a now you need a cure for all of your neurons exploding into pieces like a pop can in a freezer before right. they can bring you back and now that pushes That's, things back a, that little. Things back a little yeah. <laughs> um but uh well okay well I, I gotta hear your favorite apocalypse snare i guess no rules um you could go by most fun or most practical uh i don't care what what do you what do you take in apocalypse wise my like my favorite kind of apocalypse. Yeah, just whatever. I'm gonna. I'll leave it up to you. I uh, I mean, if we're going with like the apocalypse, I would sort of most want to like live in and like see what happens. Mm-hmm. I think it would be just like the internet going down, right? Because for a lot of people, oh, that would yeah. just be the end of the world. Yeah, you yeah. know, um, and. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe also sort of like power grid and internet. I, I would just be curious to see because, like, that would mostly be non fatal, too. I mean, yeah, hopefully not in Phoenix in the summer because that would be fatal for sensitive mm-hmm. populations. So, you know, but, um, yeah, like in terms of like an end of times, right? If like, you know, sun flare, internet goes down, power grid goes down, and for Space some reason, Space junk, gravity, Sandra Bullock. Oh, now we're writing a screenplay, aren't we? <laughs> Thanks. I was just trying to loop back to Brad Pitt again. Um, <gasps> but yeah, that's or was that Pitt or no, that was Clooney. Damn it. Um, mm. yeah, that would be. Well, that's what I was saying with the, like, ever since germ, th- now we, we just, we just have such a expectation. I'd include myself in this happily, but it was like when, when COVID happened, which are, to me, there's something like cool and trippy about it that I sort of liked in the way that, oh, this is what it would be like without the internet. It kind of had that vibe to it early mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. but, um, but a lot of people, there's a lot of people that were, I, I thought it was. I thought the most dogmatic people, people that are either like think the big guys looking out for numero uno or or people that are like manifestors uh, that create their own reality. I'm an anti-manifestationist. Yeah, me too. And there was a lot of them early on that were like, this isn't what I ordered. And (laughs) (laughs) and just like straight up. Yeah. Jump to denial very, very quickly. And yeah. uh, we're like, but if I'm manifesting everything, how could I manifest it? Um, and, oh, you know, the person that wrote the book, The Secret, they asked her, there was like a, there's the, what was that big tsunami that happened in, um, in Taiwan, like a few years ago or something? Uh, they asked her about that, and she was like, "They must have been manifesting. Uh, they must have been like putting tsunami like vibes oh out into the <laughs> thing, which is that's uh, so fucked up. It's such a way to sure just like is. blame people for yeah, systematic blaming. problems that exist in the world, or just random shit that's uncontrollable. Well, it's kind of I protective it's psychologically, right? Like, uh, like yeah, then, if it, you're then it doesn't lucky, happen to you. You know, if, yeah." 
it, it, it won't happen to you because you're doing the right things. You're putting the right vibes out there and you're being good and like you're the special one and it's the people that are deserving of it that get punished. So that's the internet one would be a good one because that would be. Like, yeah, I, I just it's like I kind of want to know, like, would we get to know our neighbors better? Would we like kind of become more grounded or mm. I, I don't know. I mean, it would probably be disastrous on many levels that yeah. like I'm not anticipating, but in terms of like the, the social component of it, it seems like that would be, you know, not a huge amount of, you know, fatality and harm. Um, and maybe like mm. a larger opportunity just to see like, well, are there parts of, how we can be human together that we might be able to come back to. Yeah. That, you know. If we cooperate enough together to get the internet back, so then we can fight again. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. the screenplay. I think we should sell that. Um, yeah. And then the end scene will be people fighting again and it'll be, we'll have one as humanity because we'll have cooperated to make it so we can fight again. Well, I guess this is, in the past, these these different scenarios that you're talking about that we overcame, we were we were very in touch with them. We were very we saw the volcano. It was more intuitive. You saw the people. You saw people with diseases and stuff, and it was a part of life. Now everything's like asymptomatic, and it's like you don't. You didn't need to know that the world was round. Like, we're the first species to ever know the world was round. Wait, and the world is round? Because that's not what my internet friends are telling me. This is, I know. <laughs> uh, but you didn't, it didn't matter what shape you thought the Earth was. And now, because there's satellites and everything else, well, someone had better know that the Earth is round because there's calculations that, depend on that so that we can be communicating right now so that food can be distributed and everything else. And I think that there's, I think the same thing is with the internet. I feel like if the internet goes down, we're toast. I think that I would probably, yeah, I think I'd be like, I think I'd be like always on guard. Uh, like, uh, I'm going to check out if I need to. So, I mean, but here's the funny thing, right? Like, during our childhood, there wasn't the internet. Yeah, I know, but. Right? Like, so, you know. But humans... then once you build structures and we, we, we keep on, we keep on changing the scaffolding and the structures of which we live on. And then once you pull something yeah. out of it. Things can come tumbling yeah. down, I like feel the, like. You know, your toaster's not going to work once the internet goes down because you got yeah. like that app on your phone to like work your toaster. Um, at least <laughs> yeah, some people do. So so how are you going to have your toast in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. There's also just like weird ways in which we take things. I don't know why I was thinking this about solar power about how badass solar power is and how frowned upon it is by like tough people or like you gotta have a diesel engine and big wheels on your truck or whatever <laughs> solar power you're literally harnessing the power of the sun we are harnessing the power of the sun that's like that's like superpower it's what's like, the that's what's like the thing that they like put plant on the superpower right plants do that that's how they like make make it work and 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 we we view that as like oh we aren't gonna listen to these wimps that want to harness the power of the sun <laughs> <laughs> totally i don't know it, yeah. I, it is what, pretty awesome but you know it's also like you have to mine a lot of resources right. to make them and if you don't know how to fix them then once they break it's like eh. okay. so yeah i mean i think it's probably part of the solution but I think like a lot of people like to almost approach like, you know, green energy or green anything from this perspective of like, you will have zero negative impact on the world by right. using this green technology. But like, there's always trade-offs and it's a matter of like, 
minimizing the negative impacts right. and like thinking of the long term sustainability. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, I mean, there's always advertising involved with all of that, too, as well. Like. Like Teslas are a great way to be like to show off your ability to, uh, uh, co- uh, to acquire resources in a way that's like, look what a good person I am. I did this for the environment. Not like you didn't buy a Prius for the environment. You bought a exceptionally expensive vehicle for the, for the environment. Totally. So there's like some of that that happens with the green stuff too. Um, yeah. But. Um, so and that, that Tesla that's like orbiting the earth now that's doing a lot for the environment too. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, oh, what do you think about the, what do you think about the, what you, the connecting to other, you think? Oh, the, what is it? The unexplained aerial phenomena? No. No? Oh, okay. I don't even care we could talk about ab- that. Do you? You don't care about that? I, I mean, I kind of do. But <laughs> I, well, I think it's kind of cool. I, I, I think yeah, it's cool that they're called it. aerial phenomena now because, like, who knows what they are? It could just be like electrical disturbances caused by microbes. I always, I always go to the microbes. So, yeah. Yeah. You think electrical disturbances caused by microbes? I don't know. I, I'm just, I was just throwing that out there. Well, my first, like yeah. the, my, my skepticism is I never believe anything that's too exciting, first off, as a default. Uh, or or just as a rule of thumb, if it's super exciting, like hold your horses. And right. then two, there's this uh, um, anthropomorphizing of aliens that always kind of drives me crazy of like, oh, you know, aliens, they'd be like us because, you know, we're the best. We're at the <laughs> We're at the pinnacle of evolution. We made it to the top. Only thing better than us would just be sort of look like us, but maybe bigger brains, like maybe like a (laughs) little longer hands or something. And uh, like that's not at all how I think about what alien life uh, would be. There's a great there's a great Netflix documentary called Alien Worlds. Have you seen it? Mm mm. Oh, it's really good. It's like David Attenborough-ish kind of. Uh, they take like evolutionary biologists and stuff, uh, going and explaining like, here's how this bird flies, and then they talk to with an astrophysicist. They're like, we discovered this planet here that could have life. Here's what the gravity is like, and then they combine and be like, here's what something would fly like in this kind of gravity, and then use CGI to make a weird uh, monster. That's awesome. That, and that's that, more what I think of when I think of aliens. Not- I totally agree with you. Like I have this memory. I think I was in kindergarten and we were supposed to like draw an alien like because in kindergarten, like that's an assignment, right? Like draw an alien. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting there and being like, hmm, like I first of all, I have not been given sufficient information about the like environment to figure out what this alien should look like. And um, I remember I resorted to putting the putting mouths on the feet because it was going to be like eating things on the ground. That's so smart. Mouth feet. Yes. How come nothing's done? Mouth feet. (laughs) (laughs) Just graze as you're walking around. Oh, man. Yeah. Now I want mouth feet. <laughs> um, you always want what you can't have. Uh, <laughs> I, um, okay. Well, yeah, I forget what I was going to talk about. I guess aliens are sort of fine enough and interesting. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, they're, they're not, they're not making my list of apocalypse scenarios that I view very likely. I'm, I'm I'm pushing my chips into uh, global warming and nuclear winters. That's that's where I'm. That's where I'm placing. I put all of my all my bets on, uh, or half on one, half on the other. Is mm. what? Ah, uh, maybe I should give a third to a virus. That's sweet. I mean, you, the thing you is, you think a virus would ever just ravage through our population? I don't think so. No, that would never. That could never. That could I never mean, happen. I mean, just knock everybody <laughs> out. I mean, like fall over wise, not like a, not like a global pandemic kind of thing. Not like it. Well, <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying that if it was 
if it was um uh if it was virulent enough where people were just like yeah yeah, like. Well, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. COVID revealed something very important. So for a very long time, evolutionary biologists were like, don't worry. There's a trade-off between virulence and transmissibility. So the more mm-hmm. virulent something is, the less transmissible it's going to be. And everybody's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Totally. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So we can all feel OK. We're never going to have something, you know, ravage the population and kill everybody. But. COVID showed us that it's possible for viruses to escape that trade-off um, mm. by, uh, for example, what COVID does is makes people feel fine for a while, feel mm. fine while they're most transmissible. In fact, if you look at like viral shedding versus like when symptoms come on, the worst shedding of the virus is before people have any symptoms. And that's also, you know, there's also other things going on like COVID messing with your pain receptors. So you're like, I feel awesome. So if there's something that's like COVID, but Mm. more lethal, but it makes you feel really good for the first week and a half, two weeks, month, and then then we're fucked. Yeah, that's true. If it hit you like two months later, even, yeah. I mean, not, I, I don't want to be like a big downer or anything, but like if COVID killed 90% of people and yeah. everything else was kind of the same, yeah, this yeah. would, you know, we wouldn't be right. joking about apocalypse dish things because it right. would, this it would, would be. just be post-apocalyptic times right now oh we'd still be joking because we'd have to we, we yeah we would choice. because otherwise we couldn't survive if we lost <laughs> our sense of humor but um right yeah you know it's, hmm. so yeah, you into it you into that you putting it up there on the you you convinced me to put a third of my chips into a covid like situation where it's because you're right tuberculosis could take 15 years and then just people start going to <laughs> <laughs> And then just slowly start, but something, there's no, nothing to stop something from having a little. I think we're more vulnerable to pandemics than any of us want to face. Now that doesn't mean that that is the only thing that we have to worry about, right? There's a lot of other stuff and climate change um, accelerates the pace of, you know, infectious disease spread and the way that yeah. we're, you know, engaging in deforestation, right? You're getting all these animals that are getting pushed into areas they wouldn't. So more yeah. possibilities for zo- zoonotic diseases. So squeezing them more together and uh, yeah. Yeah. And bringing them into places where humans are, where they weren't before. So, I mean, it's all a big cluster fuck apocalyptic Plus situation. Plus industrialized farming. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, did it all, I mean, kind of it always felt apocalyptic right through the past. And then there's probably always a feeling of like, but this one, this one though is the real. I mean, my whole life I heard Jesus was coming back and every other thing. I imagine for the last thousands of years, someone was, people have been talking about this and that with a rapture or Mayan calendar or had their own doomsday scenarios but this one this one hits different this one i mean doesn't is it is it egocentrism that for us to think that like i'm a part of the big one i'm in it for the the, you the mean big like show the real the, apocalypse uh, is gonna yeah. happen in our lifetime yeah yeah like that you you get to see the grand finale so like, i mean what a coincidence though manifestation it, of like generational narcissism Something I I mean, wouldn't it <laughs> wouldn't it be bizarre if we were the ones to see the end of humanity? Because it's because it's and don't worry, audience, we'll get to kombucha soon, but um <laughs> after the end of the world. <laughs> after the end of the world. <laughs> we drink. Um but wouldn't it be um I mean, it just seems so odd. What are the chances that, I mean, 
some some generations going to be a, around when the end of humanity happens if it does happen in a whoop, short amount of time but what are the chances really that it's us after what 250,000 years debatable maybe 100,000 years you'd call us humans or something like that probably longer and what are the chances that it really happens in the next 40 years though i just saw some chart that showed like very there's some great thing you can look up the the temperature of where you are from starting from like the 1800s and what the temp, what the annual temperature has been and it's uh it's compelling it's, it's yeah <laughs> i mean so here in arizona right i mean it so it's the beginning of the summer we're already in apocalyptic fire zone and yeah. if you you know it, but if you think about it this is going to be one of the coolest summers that um, we have in the next 10 years. Yeah. It's only going to get warmer. Yeah. Huh. Skipping that trip to Arizona. And then <laughs> and then the worst, you know, it's funny. I planned uh, 2019, 2020, that New Year's. I was like, I'm going to Arizona because I want to be warm. And then it was uh, like the coldest cold snap they'd ever have because that happens too with extreme yep. weather where you have the the most extremes of everything and yeah, molecules like in the ocean in zip around faster and it creates more hurricanes and all sorts of i mean we really might be living through some i will say i don't know if i if a lot of people would share this vibe but there was something about covid for me when it started where there's like a lot of times I'm just like kind of meh on life. Like eh, I can take it or leave it, whatever it is, what it is. I'm just here. I'm existing. I think it's more of like, I feel like I don't have a choice in the matter. So it's just like, well, I guess I'm here. Um, and, uh, where I here, think some here, people are, here we are, here we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whereas a lot of people are just like, I'm choosing life every day. <laughs> and maybe it's just like something subjectively that I have to flip in my mind, whatever it is. There's been periods of time in my life where I could have, where I was like, I've had enough of this. I don't need this anymore. And when COVID happened, I was like, oh, I'm so happy that I stuck around to see this. This is <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> like if I would have went back and told myself when I was like a teenager, like, hey, I know you're going through some dark times, but don't worry. One day you'll be a comedian. My teenage self probably would have been like, yeah, yeah, okay. But but if I would go back and tell my teenage self, like, there's going to be sort of an apocalyptic situation that you'll get to witness, I would have been like, okay, all right, sold. I'll stick around. <laughs> I'll stick around for that. I don't know. That's really interesting, actually, because I, I mean, I think there's huge differences in, like, how people psychologically deal with the shit hitting the fan. And, you know, for some people, it's like, all right, when are things going to go back to normal? Mm -hmm. Right. And for other people, it's like, whoa, this is interesting. This is different. What do we like? What now? And how can we change? How can we pivot? And, um, you know, I think just like my, you know, nature, like I'm much more of a pivoter. I'm like, yeah. whoa, okay. And now like, what does this yeah. change? Um, and I don't get too caught up and attached to yeah. the plans that I had. And that's even though like I'm a maybe pathological planner, like I will plan, I will plan shit. But like, if things mm. change, I'm like, all right, let's new plan. Yeah. And yeah, so, same. um, so, but not everybody is like that and that's okay. But it's also like, you know, if things do need to change, then things do need to change. And it can mm -hmm. be harder to change if you're really attached to how things were. So, mm -hmm. so I don't know. I mean, there, there, I think there is like sort of different, you know, like psychological types in the apocalypse. Maybe, maybe we should make like a little quiz that we can put online. Like what kind of, you know, apocalypse personality are you? That uh, is a that could really be totally not based on science, just like on us bullshitting. Yeah. Well, because there's, you know, all the all the preppers that you know they made TV shows about these guys. People have, I, 
I think there's, you know, there's kind of a non-trivial number of people that are legit preppers that have like that stock stuff up that have some of them have bunkers. Some of them just have like arms and other things and are like obsessed about security and everything else. And those, those, uh, when COVID happened, those people didn't make it like a week before they were like storming state capitals and stuff <laughs> like that. I'm like, wait, I thought you had a 20 year supply. Uh, like you've been dreaming of this moment. You've been, you've been building a shrine to your fears for the last 20 years of your life, waiting for something like this to happen. And the moment they were like, Hey, you got to hunker down for a little while. People are like, I can't handle it. <laughs> it's a weird. Yeah, there was certainly there was certainly that, but you know, I I have to say though, Shane, I think like we shouldn't other the prepper because yeah. like there there's many many different ways Kinds that people of... prep, and like I mean, I would say now, I mean, I don't know. If I would say I'm a prepper, maybe. I mean, I like I've got my go bag. I have my shelter in place kit. I have my little everyday carry whenever I go camping. I have a thing in my car. I, you know, have like water. Oh, you yeah. Know, so much more reasonable. And, like, yeah, I'm not. You know, I'm just like I'm just a ripcord kind of a guy. I don't have anything prepped. I'm just like if it hits the fan, I'm like, good run. All right. See, everybody. I had a nice time. That's like always. <laughs> It's always just, uh, I got a, I got an exit strategy, but that's not the, uh, uh, that's so that's, you know, I'm not, no judgment. That's there. Those are more conscientious people that you're a more conscientious person than I am because you have things together and whatnot. I'm a little, uh, I'm a little more cancerous and like sloppy, lazy, having a party. Some of my stuff leaks out and it, and then, then I go and invade that area. <laughs> you know what, though? Like, in the apocalypse, like, we're going to need comedians. So, like, yeah. you, can, you can have some of my preps, like, in the apocalypse. Because <laughs> Good looking crowd tonight. All right. Seriously. <laughs> I would eat all of you. <laughs> you think we'd do the cannibalism thing? Has that happened in, in, uh, in apocalyptic scenario? I Because I know there's cultures that have just like, my grandmother died. We eat her brain. That's how we honor her. But has there ever, has there ever because of, uh, you, you know, the movie about the airplane that came yeah. down? So cannibalism like, is very, very rare. Yeah. Um, and it has happened in like famine situations. So like in the Irish potato famine. It happened. Really? Um, it happened during, you know, some unfortunate situations when people were <laughs> migrating out west and got caught in the winter, um, not, you know, quite making it to California. Um, so it has happened, but it's very rare. And there are many situations where people are totally starving, you know, dying of starvation and do not resort to Picky cannibalism. eaters. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Shane. Um, uh. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's pretty rare. Well, because uh, yeah. because when you say apocalypse, I think at least before COVID, I think it wasn't a very nuanced thing in most people's minds. I think it was like what happens is there's like wars and we're all eating each other and that's what an apocalypse looks like i don't know uh is there uh, yeah anyway so so you have <laughs> i think that we're just going to be talking about apocalypses on this episode and then i'll have you back soon to talk about booch is yeah, that sure. uh <laughs> is that okay do that yeah did you get yeah. your did you like get kombucha ready and everything for you're going to show me things that's that's my um, oh kombucha. Shoot. well now i feel like you should show me kombucha I mean, we could do like a like a little preview. Yeah, let's do a let's do a preview. You want a preview. little preview? Yeah. So I'm drinking right now um, a secondary fermentation. This is um, my peach ginger honey kombucha. Um, Ooh, I yeah. got I got orange blood orange carrot ginger. 
Um, All right. It's not. I, I'm good. not advertising this one, by the way. It's actually a decent one. It's just like the one. Uh-huh. It's just like a classic yep. health. It, 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 it's it's not the best one out there. There's a. It's it's like a mid range in price and quality sort of mm. situation. So um, the the not you yet trademarked own. brand name for my homemade kombucha yeah. is Mutual Aid. Ooh. Oh, so does yours have alcohol in it? No. I mean, a little bit because it, you know, like that's one of the byproducts that comes from making it. But I, oh, I it's thought not you much. had to like, I thought you had to take alcohol out of it when you were done to, I didn't, I don't know anything. So if you are trying to sell it in the store um, and there's more than 2%, then yeah, then they have to like, take it out or they have to sell it as alcoholic mm. hmm. and mine has some in it just because that happens when you brew it and i definitely don't take it out but it's so little that you know i mean i drink it when i'm doing very important interviews with people like you so <laughs> <laughs> oh, you also have a to-go bag in case of a fire so i, f- I feel like I feel like a 2% alcohol buzz to take the edge off <laughs> is... I, I don't even feel it, honestly. But maybe that's because I drink it all the time. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's it's that's my... um That's how I grow it. That the stuff on the top, those are scobies. I mean, I could bring it scobies? over if you want. Yeah. Sure, if you want. It's heavy, so, you know. All right, here we go. It's heavy. See, those are scobies in there. What are scobies? They're um. Here, let me put it back down. Um, they are these biofilms that are made by um, bacteria and yeast. Mm. And then they live in them, and uh, they also like live in the actual kombucha itself. And uh, yeah, they they make it delicious. Hmm. They're cooperating in there. That's the preview. So that's what that's we're going to talk. Uh, spend a whole episode talking about um, kombucha and how and what it tells us about how um, uh, uh, bacteria and things like that cooperate with one another. Right. Mm-hmm. That's kind yep. of the gist of what we're going to talk about. That'll yeah. be all because uh, I'm a big. You got well. You just start, you just kind of looked into it because of. Uh, you started making your own kombucha yeah. and then yep. you're a science nerd. So you're like, what's up with this stuff? And then there's like exactly. no research yeah, going on. And you were like, well, I'm well suited to study. Um, <laughs> this I've got fr- some wet lab space that is free. <laughs> Let me bring this in. So <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to that next time. Um, which will probably be soon. Maybe I'll just have you back on sooner rather than later. Um, to talk about kombucha uh, and your cancer book. I want to read to, oh man, we have so many conversations left to have in this life. If there's not a, an apocalypse first. So you have, you have some chips and we're all, we're betting on the apocalypse scenario. So the internet's that one sounds like it's the most fun for you. I mean, I think as a, like, you know, anthropological of human nature. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, that's the one I would be most interested in, and it seems like it would be minimally tragic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the that's the that's what's been so interesting and frustrating, but about seeing humans' reaction to this different scenario is uh, is is pretty amazing, um, and. Uh, yeah, but what it, it's it's I I have plenty of weaknesses of my own, but it's it's funny to see, um, like I have I know people that are terrified of everything, like always have been, don't 
I, I grew up in an area that's like, I grew up around a, a lot of people that were just very, very low in openness and big into tradition and routine and don't take a lot of chances and are just fearful of, of everything. And like, you're going to swim in the river? Uh, <laughs> like, what if you get swept away and there's gross stuff in the river and COVID <laughs> comes around and they're like, well, you got to live your life. And it's just this, <laughs> it was, it was mm -hmm. so we, you know, I mean, we're not, we're not great with statistical reasoning. Um, generally I do. I love the, I like thinking about the availability heuristic, the, the, for the listeners, just the idea of the more readily you can picture something in your mind, the, more probable your brain tends to think that it is, which in this day and age is typically a mistake. Like the more readily, like you can picture a zombie, like, ah, like an actual dead thing that crawled out of the ground and come attack you. You can picture that much more easily than you can picture like this virus goes in and attacks these pain receptors and then it makes you a little more energetic and you want to get out and be more social you can't really picture that in the same in the same way so that that more probable thing seems less probable um because of that and same with just like a river you could you picture someone drowning or whatever <laughs> i went out the fourth of July, um, twenty twenty, I went out with um with with uh, some extended family that were like very skeptical of of COVID. It was my one chance that I that I took, uh, and it was because of social pressure. And we went out on a pontoon boat, and there was just like herds of. Pe this is before we knew that much about COVID and everything else. There's herds of people all over the beach that they're just like, oh, it's nice to see people out again as I'm looking like, oh my God, this is this is a nightmare situation. This is mm -hmm. this means two weeks from now things are going to be horrible. And 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 then I jumped in the river to cool off and they're like, what are you doing? Oh! <laughs> it was <laughs> And You're like I'm on a pontoon. <laughs> it's like, and just people are just not great at r wrapping their heads around new changes and things in statistical analysis. And I mean, th I sound like a yeah. dick saying that because I'm not saying like I am, and not that I don't fall for a myriad of horseshit myself. But no, it's true. We're I mean, we're not built to process you know like the numbers and then come up with like this is how i feel about this risk because you know our ancestors like they didn't have statistics they didn't have yeah. actuarial tables where it was like here's the likelihood that this shit's gonna happen it was more like you know what did you see what are people telling you about what they saw um and you know and that's kind of how we would figure out if we should or shouldn't be doing something. And I don't know, an another like, this is sort of speculative, but I think if, if we look at human history, a lot of, you know, public health efforts, um, you know, they like were effective, not necessarily because people had any understanding of the science underlying them or the risks and, you know, mechanisms, but because they sort of got entwined with like cultural practices and religious practices. Like mm -hmm. you think about like mummification back in the day, like probably like that was about reducing the likelihood of infectious diseases spreading from corpses. Interesting. Probably, I, I, I'm speculating here, but it's like, you know, like there's probably a lot of things like that where, you know, the societies that did those things maybe did a little bit better yeah. than the societies that didn't. But the reasoning, you know, individually yeah. or culturally for doing them was not necessarily based yeah, on yeah. a scientific understanding or a statistical understanding. And that's that's pretty damn new, you know, yeah. to even have epidemiology is that's very new. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People just stumble on a practice that that works. Yeah, I, I do. I get a kick out of the way that um, 
the way that we kind of jump through hoops to try to put the statistics in various metaphors that people can wrap their heads around because they get numb to the numbers. So then you have to be like, all right, so if every death was a golf cart and you wanted to fit all those golf carts side by side, it would fill up all of Texas and Oklahoma. And people are like, whoa, that's so many <laughs> golf carts. Oh my God, this is serious. <laughs> And it's just this, this, this weird. Have you seen those things? Where no, but that like, sounds awesome. I, I mean, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a made up one, but uh, but there's always like, you, you know, when yeah. you try to explain like a uh, what a, how much a terabyte is or something, it's like this is how many pictures it could hold, and you could stack it to Mars or whatever. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. What do you think about the Mars situation? I'm a I'm a Mars civilization skeptic um, for, I think, very good reason. <laughs> but people are like, Elon Musk is going to do it. He's going to get us to Mars. And I'm like, I think that dude might be a fuck, actually. I think he might be full <laughs> of shit. But uh, I'm curious as someone that's like interested in uh, human civilization's future and ending and surviving yeah. of things. Well, you know, so I was just out in, um, you know, the desert this past weekend, it was 105 degrees, you know, looking at these ruins of, you know, past civilizations and it was fucking hot, you know, but like yeah. I had my water and, um, you know, I was fine, but you know, I'm like, finding like amazing like shards of pottery and like scrapers and there's all these you know amazing buildings and I'm thinking like I literally was thinking to myself you know if there was a planet that had conditions that were you know even like 20 degrees hotter than right here right now like Elon Musk would just be like this is where humanity should go but like yeah. nobody is like dying to colonize the desert here in <laughs> right. Arizona. So, yeah. you know, I don't know. It just seems like kind of misguided to put energy and effort into like this notion that there is a planet out there that is going to be habitable enough for us. Um, you know, given that we evolved here, right? Like we evolved on this planet for these conditions. So the chances that there'll be a planet that is even in the range of survivability for us is pretty mm -hmm. damn small. Um, and then the amount of energy that it would require to move it to something habitable um, is crazy. And that energy and time and effort and resource, like that would be put to much better use to make our planet more habitable. You would think so. To me, it seems like a PR stunt from a narcissist that also is well, that too. maybe having some manic episodes from here and there. I'm saying that as a bipolar <laughs> person who has manic episodes. I'm like, that seems like I, I've thought shit like that before. And uh, when I yeah. do it, people put me in a psych ward. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so what are you what are you betting on most likely? like apocalyptic scenario, like some maybe we'll get to see, maybe we'll get to uh, witness or, or, I mean, I guess the nuke thing, you just evaporate perhaps and, or a yeah. segment of the population does and you don't get to see, but something that could happen in our lifespan. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of hard to say here this, I'm going to put my chips on this discrete thing because I do think that like the clusterfuck is kind of the more likely thing because, mm -hmm. you know, the way our society is organized now, all of our systems are so interdependent in ways that like you mess with one, th one thing over here and it fucks stuff up over here. And, you know, and I'm not just talking about like the consequences of like having a global economy. I'm also talking about things like, you know, when you start messing with global climate, that does change, you know, where species are going, which then changes how disease can spread. And so like all these problems that, you know, maybe for our ancestors were a little bit more discreet, right? Like it's a volcano or it's a neighboring tribe or it's a disease. Um, for us, they're going to be all 
entwined with each other in a wicked way. I mean, they already are now. Um, but yeah, I think like our most likely apocalypse is a sort of like reverberating consequences through multiple systems kind of apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. That's where a lot of chips are being placed. I, I think um, it's like the positive feedback fucked up wicked shit. Well, that's the other thing with past human history. Um, so this is, this is maybe one of the downsides of science was in the past you have an active volcano you're forming belief systems around that that you're cooperating around or or you're stumbling on things like on one side of the volcano they're saying like the volcano god says to be fruitful and multiply and then on the other side they say the volcano god says to never have sex and and then one civilization does better because they integrated the uh, be fruitful and multiply part into who they were. But it, but it's like this arbitrary thing that that you use the this scary threat and the the unpredictability of it leading to a belief that you could collect around. And now there's something about like being able to predict those things to an extent that just has people like fighting more about who has more control over, over the situation. And, hmm. um, so that's interesting. I, yeah. But people all still believe all sorts of weird shit. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. That's that not hasn't going gone away. away. No, no, <laughs> no, that's not going doesn't away. It doesn't matter like how much science there is, but and, they're like, just not cooperating around it anymore. Mm. I mean, although I mean, it depends like it, you know what we're talking about when we say cooperation because right. people cooperate for all sorts of horrible things like yeah yeah war and storming the capital and right i mean like that's right, right. a lot of cooperation it's just not in the service of something that we think is good yeah right? yeah okay so this is like a um this is a like a is it is it craps where like the odds change and you can do like red or black but you can also put something on like a number or 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 go for longer odds or what here's what i'm getting at clusterfuck is the easy bet give me something that's a long shot that pays like um uh, like one to uh, you know it pays like 500 or something for every chip that you're you're putting on there i don't know what you get paid in during a apocalyptic scenario um uh if it's yeah i don't i don't know what whatever whatever currency that we use during apocalypses that we, we haven't invented yet apocalypse um, coin we just invented it and you can buy it on the app um by the time this episode comes out right shane we're gonna how, how is there not coin. apocalypse coin there, there i bet there it is. is there is now there is now yeah. so yeah <laughs> it's me, the only currency that's going to be good in the apocalypse so give me some long shot like real long odds pays off big if you win and but it's on the board as a possibility okay so um in i teach an evolutionary psychology class and a few years ago i was like i'm gonna make this more fun for my students mm -hmm. and more fun for me for my grading sure. so i added uh, an assignment i took out a more boring assignment i had an assignment um it was basically like you know what's your favorite apocalypse and mm -hmm. what things about human nature did you learn in this class that could help you survive this apocalypse mm -hmm. so you know, it was basically a way for us to kind of have have some fun, but also talk about evolutionary psychology. One of my students <clears throat> came up with a uh, a great scenario, which um, I'm going to <laughs> uh, adopt here, um, which is um, an alien invasion, but not the kind that you might typically think about. Mm. Um, this is a um, pathogen from outer space that infects humans and um yeah decimates our population yeah. so it's you know it's it's not the humanoid aliens it's not even aliens That's with alien mouth feet. i can get behind yeah aliens that didn't even know they did it just yeah. like yeah th threw some trash out the window it 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 uh, of their spaceship it lands on earth they never even knew it decimates our entire civilization 
I feel like that's I feel like that's how that that's the kind of that that's the you don't see a movie like that, but that's It'd the more boring. realistic um alien apocalypse situation where they didn't even they didn't even realize because <laughs> uh, think of all the species we've decimated without even being like Phew, i had no idea yeah um well this has been great why don't you tell people about zombified because that's kind of more fitting for what the conversation that we've had by the way you should check out the book, The Cheating Cell, How Evolution Helps Us Understand and Treat Cancer, because I'm going to get it and I'll read most ha- <laughs> ha- half half of skim, it. Skim it. Skim it. Yep. And then <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll have Athena back on. And so I'll uh, you can send some questions. But um, uh, since you guys like this podcast i'd imagine you would like athena's as well it's called zombified available all sorts of everywheres as every podcast is these days tell people about zombified um well shane zombified is your source for fresh brains so if you are looking for something you know delicious to get you through the apocalypse um there is a, a large assortment of brains everybody from psychologists uh to you know people who study the impact of technology on society to preppers to um people who study mindfulness I, every every kind of person you could imagine um is on the podcast and what we talk about is the things that kind of take over our brains without us realizing it so you know all of those kinds of um you know processes going on under the surface that zombify us that mm. we don't we don't think about most of the time so amazing yeah yeah and we talk about the apocalypse a lot too because why not who does your art this awesome artist uh named neil smith he uh does everything from like um figures for like nature publications to zombie shit so wow really cool i i have i partnered with the artist for my um new podcast mind under matter and it's a delightful experience but yeah this is wow yeah he's he's awesome he also does all of our artwork for channel z which is our our live stream channel um which is on summer hiatus now but uh during the academic semester we're doing shows every monday at uh at 10 30 arizona time what's your vibe for um because you have your you you usually do a zombie conference or something right like once a yep, year yep every other year so the last one was all online and you can actually see like 90 percent of it on youtube if you go to channel z on youtube um we have the most of the meeting is up and we ran it as a super interactive live streamed event so when was kind of it? podcast style. It was last October. So. Oh, okay, so yeah. you got two years. You get you you have your next one's going to be um, next year October potentially. You do that in person, yeah. right? I I feel Hopefully, good yeah. about that one. Yeah, in person. Yep. I, we'll probably do most of it in person. We might do some of it um, live stream so that mm. people can be a part of it from wherever they are because that's one of the nice things about the. Live stream is, you know, if you do it right, it can actually include people from all over the place. And we had, you know, like people from all different countries joining us and even like, you know, a haunted house tour from the Netherlands. Like it was it was great because we had people from all over the place um, and uh, we were, you know, kind of trying to figure out how to deal with the apocalypse together because I was still you know, October was still people, you know, we oh, that was really before, sure we were that was before the big, uh, the big, I mean, that was pretty, that was one thing most people that I talked to got right. They were like, winter's going to be awful. And, yeah. uh, and it was, yeah. yep. um, yeah. well, uh, well, cool. Well, thanks so much for coming back on the show. I'm going to get you back on to, we'll do, we'll do some kombucha 
uh, we'll do a kombucha episode. We'll do, we're going to have um, so much fun. We got to have, we got to get more in before the end of the world. So I appreciate you joining the show once again, My Athena pleasure. Actipus. And thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week. <laughs>